Hi, everybody. Dr. Friedman here. It's day three. It's week two. Uh, and it's my birthday. Uh, and because of that, um, we focused on some stuff that I've written. And this is a week that's going to be um, thinking a little bit about how to write about games, um, anticipating the some of the tasks um, that students will be choosing from that often include doing some sort of assessment or review of a play test experience or otherwise kind of figuring out how to write about um, a game system and how it works. So today I introduced students to an academic piece that was published by me, a popular audience um, piece that I'm still working through, as well as Matt Coville's video essay, um, all on the same subject, which is um, what Coville calls, and I agree with him, the climax of Critical Role Campaign 1. The moment, and I'll link in the notes below, where uh, Sam Regal as Scanlan realizes that he is going to give up his uh, ninth level spell slot, which he's been saving for Wish, in order to save the day, but at the cost of not being able to save uh, the character of his best friend, Liam O'Brien, playing Vaxeldon. A quick note about what I saw on Perusal. So Perusal are annotating uh, software interface where students engage with these written and video pieces. What was amazing to me was not only the emotion experienced by the kind of critters who are in the room, and there are a few of them, Not a, it's not the majority of the room, um, but a, not, uh, a, a good vocal minority um, were kind of having flashbacks to the emotion, but also the folks who have no experience of critical role and no experience of Dungeons and Dragons through the way that Koval and I in these different media were able to communicate the emotional weight of this moment, um, that they too kind of had that feeling of, oh gosh, this is something really powerful. Um, several of them have expressed interest in watching Critical Role. And of course, then the question becomes, I can't assign a thousand hours or even 400 hours of, or even really the run of Exandria Unlimited, which is an eight episode, but eight times four is still a lot um, of gameplay to watch. However, uh, this week um, in response to some discussion on Twitter, Amy Carrero has kindly offered to come and visit us. Um, and so we will be focusing our attention on um, one episode, a kind of capsule or bottle episode of Exandria Unlimited uh, by the road, uh, which is focused on by Rodin. I really like this idea of this particular week and we're, this is a week five thing, so stay tuned. Um, I'll talk about it more when we, when we get there, but as I told students today, what I like about that is about Amy very kindly agreeing to come is Amy, like most of our students, is coming into D&D &D totally cold. Unlike us, although I think we're very curious about it, uh, she's also doing it for the first time in front of tens of thousands of people. Um, at a time um, and more watching thereafter. And also she's a working actress and how this fits into her sensibilities around acting process, I think ties in nicely to some of the reactions and questions that I saw about O'Brien and Regal's performances um, as they were being discussed in our readings and viewings for today. So I'm really excited about that. Um, that week of actual play was also already including another Abria Iyengar DM'd piece, um, the edited down um, first episode of Misfits and Magic on Dimension 20. So it's going to be an interesting week moving forward, uh, thinking about the difference between edited and less edited um, actual plays. Um, and as well as a host of other kinds of things that I think there's a lot to be said about the construction of by Rodin as um, inspired heavily by Laredo in a performance space where a majority of the, of the performers have some connection to the U.S. South. I'll, I'll obviously go on at length. Um, so that was a kind of seed that got planted today. Um, some of our discussion also ended up being 
more about mechanics of D&D &D than I expected. We're not getting to that until week four, kind of by design, because I didn't want us to feel like Dungeons and Dragons was the end all and be all. But I think that for a class that is majority unfamiliar, there's a real desire to kind of understand and grok that. One of the things I tried to kind of, uh, you know, use Critical Role as a way into is to say, um, many people who come into the show, into the media ecology that is the Critical Role set of entertainment opportunities, many of them don't have experience with D&D &D, um, or role-playing games, they're, uh, and they're still able to get something out of it. In the same way, this class doesn't have the notion that you're going to be a master, a dungeon master, or a master of dungeons. Um, but the, hopefully you find something that's exciting to you in this space, in this set of ideas, in this genre, um, in this collective of games that you can connect to. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that more on Thursday as students get closer and closer to writing an initial contract about what their pathway through this semester is going to be. So stay tuned. And of course, a reminder that there is a video about the grading contract uh, also on the channel. Uh, so I think it was a it was not the day I expected in a lot of ways. Um, but what was really lovely is the kind of excitement and energy that people are bringing even in just the reporting of the reporting. Um, so I'm very curious and interested about what will happen um, when students actually are able to see more than just a clip. The other thing we talked about is kind of what are the training wheels on the way to more complex systems? Shadowrun got mentioned as another complex system, and that's when I just about fell out of my seat if I'd been sitting. Um, but... I pointed the way to one pagers. Uh, Grant Hewitt's Honey Heist is a really great example of a good one pager, look like light mechanics, not as minimal as the GMless system of For the Queen, which students grokked I think really well last week, um, but not as many moving parts as your shadow runs, your D and Ds, a lot of your more traditional tabletop role playing games that have a hundreds of page uh, player's guide, you know, storyteller's guide, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so I've pointed students to my Itch.io page, um, which has lists of those kinds of games and some other kinds of storytelling games, um, as well as some that I've provided teasers to on Perusal. Um, so that's coming up. Um, and uh, next week we will take a look at... Um, uh, thousand year old vampire a little bit of a taster of that and some twine adventures that I hope will help us m keep moving along um, so that we don't kind of have the idea that D, D is everything this is the problem with having to front load readings that are also um, people writing about role-playing games because the vast majority of scholarship that writes about role-playing games if they write with specificity or even if they don't, they end up falling back on kind of the truisms of D&D &D because it is seen as this origin point. And so this is something for students who are pedagogically minded and for my colleagues who might be watching this that are thinking pedagogically minded. This is the challenge, right? Like we want, we don't want students to imbibe this, these sets of assumptions about what role playing games are, but if we turn to the best examples of things that very quickly give the vocabulary, very quickly give some of the history, very quickly get people up to speed, it also means that students have the sense that, oh, it's D&D, &D, or D&D &D is a kind of major player and I need to understand D&D, &D, and D&D &D has a danger of becoming synonymous. Um, d and is great. I love D&D. &D. I'm running D&D. &D. I play D&D. &D. We talked a lot about my druid today and the things that she does and doesn't do. Um, in D&D, &D, but I, I'm being, trying to be very intentional in m making sure that D&D, &D, that this is not a, this is not a course about D&D, &D, um, or not just about D&D. &D. Um, so to that end, um, 
in this week about writing about games, um, on Thursday, we're going to have our first virtual class visit from my good friend, Mix Tiffany Lee, um, who, among many other things that they do that are amazing um, in this uh, fascinating world, um, they are a reviewer of games. And so we are um, reading uh, two reviews that they've written, um, one for Block by Block Insurrect, the Insurrection called In the Shadow of Protest, and uh, the Brindlewood Bay RPG and the Mystery of Cozy. Um, there's two smaller readings that are also happening that are kind of more at that theoretical level. Um, so we're going to see how it lands. Um, we may still have folks who are in the weeds thinking mechanically, but I hope that with the addition of Brindlewood Bay in particular, we can get past the D&D &D as, as the only touchstone. So um, make of that what you will. Um, nevertheless, this was a very good day, and not just because I got dice. I got dice, y'all. Um, I can be bribed, um, and I cannot be bribed, but I, I can be, I'm very appreciative of student labor, um, and I'm so excited about this. Um, I've started to hear from students about potential projects, including, you know, um, video ethnographies of people's gaming groups, um, some ideas around creating adventures, um, and uh, a whole lot more. So I'm excited to see what comes. Um, I'm going to be taking a look at those uh, ideas and thinking throughs um, on mon next Monday. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, so um, this is a this is a kind of bonkers day, um, and it's uh, a very strange experience to have students read your writing um, in any scenario. It is even stranger when it's still work in progress. And so one of the kind of questions that I had in my head was, is this thing that has moved me so much and that they watched, you know, move Matt Coville to tears, um, I write about it in my essay, you know, Matt's in tears and so am I. Um, if it doesn't land, it can be really, um, I don't want to say embarrassing or frustrating or any of those things, it, it, but it feels weird for sure if it doesn't land, like, because we're, we're still in the space of creating community and trust and these sorts of things. Um, and so it's really, really lovely to see students even as they're feeling kind of like a little bit at sea with mechanics and themes and this whole new subculture that many of them are totally unfamiliar with. But when you put in it in the language of community witnessing of things like sports or performance, and when you talk about it as friends at a table, which of course is so much of the discourse that Critical Role talks about when it talks about itself, it becomes much more understandable. So while there's lots of questions that are still up in the air as of today, um, I think there we have gotten to the place of commitment and engagement, which is enormously gratifying. So I'm going to stop because I'm still fizzy. Um, but as always, you can ask me more questions um, by tweeting me at Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. -E. Um, you can put comments below. And if you're, of course, my student, I'll see you on Thursday uh, and uh, we'll talk then. Um, so thanks, everybody. <laughs>